Good morning. I'm Jim Moore, and you are watching Words of Encouragement. And it is Tuesday, April, no, wait a minute, May 10th. And this is program number 478. So nice to have you today. Uh, we're going to be looking into the scriptures that declare what the kingdom of God is and what it is not. And uh, we're going to be talking about the ending of human conflict and war. So you're going to want to pay close attention. I've got a number of links for you today, all of which I believe came by the Spirit of the Lord today. So that excites me. I don't know how you feel about that, but when I feel like I'm in a vein and suddenly the Lord, um, somebody sends me a text or something like that, it, um, and it goes along with the vein that I'm in, it impresses my heart. It's like, oh, yay, the Holy Spirit is uh, talking to me and I actually am here in the Lord. Debbie, God bless you. Good morning. Hope you're doing well today. So the friend that sent me uh, the links this morning, his name is Andy, and he's uh, been a friend for many years, and I wanted to say thank you to him. I want to just show or actually declare some appreciation. I know some of you are going to freak out about this, but I'm going to thank God for Facebook. Now, there's a lot about Facebook I don't like, but I do like the fact that I'm able to be on here every single day. And so somebody said, why don't you get off those those uh, things, and um, I, I will say what uh, Jeremiah Johnson, a um, popular minister today, said. He said, as long as I can use the avenues of the enemy uh, to glorify God, I'm going to do that. And so, yeah, I, some of these, you know, internet venues, I wouldn't say they're definitely the enemy. It's just like the television, the internet, the radio, the whatever, walkie-talkies, they're not, they're amoral, okay? Internet is not moral or immoral, it's amoral. It means it's really about what we do with it, the same way as something as basic an element like fire. Fire is not moral, fire is not immoral, it is what we say amoral. In other words, it's all about what we do with it. So anyway, just thankful to be able to come to you every day and talk to you. I appreciate your prayers. Um, I'm going to jump right into it this morning. I don't want to ramble on too much, but I do want to say thank you for those of you who are holding up Linda and I. We are still in a transition season. I know many of you are as well, so we are, can identify with your, um, you know, unique challenges right now and you ours, and so we do ask you to continue to pray for us. You know, we need direction, we need financing, we need wisdom. Uh, we are going to be in the valley uh, probably in just a few weeks, and we have a number of meetings lined up there. So look forward, hopefully, to seeing some of you who are in the area. All right. And I will try to remember to send those out soon to where you can put them on your calendar. Angie, God bless you. Nice to have you this morning. And when I say that, I really mean it. You know, you guys, it is really nice to have you. Nothing is harder than just to sit here and do a program and nobody shows up. It's like going to church on a Sunday morning and you're the pastor and you're going to stand up and preach and there's nobody in the pews except like your, your mom or your wife, which we love them too, but right. All right, <clears throat> so I want to direct you to the, um, the links because I believe all of them and I've got four of them. Now, one of them is a watching link. So I'm not going to go into it deep, but many of you are aware that an event called The Send is happening uh, in Kansas City. And this is bringing together a number of powerful leaders from around the globe together to, to go to the next phase, to help launch the body of Christ into the next phase. Hi, Ramona. God bless you. So... You can go on the internet, look up the send. It'll, it's all over the internet. You can find it. But in addition to that, and I believe that starts on the 14th. I could be mistaken. I don't get to go. I'm sad about that. But uh, I know I got a lot of friends who are going. But a few days, starting actually today, and I didn't really realize this. I was a little out of touch with this. But there is also a prophecy that was given over 20 years ago about night and day worship going on a, a the Harry Truman property, which is very close to the International House of Prayer in Kansas City that's been going for 20-some years, night and day, without a break. Yes, that's for real. 
Um, anyway, a prophecy I believe was given by Bob Jones that they're going to go to the Harry Truman. Now, many of you don't know Harry Truman was a, a one of our presidents that he actually helped bring the nation of Israel into back into existence, 1940 and all that. He was a an intercessor, an inter he he intervened on behalf of Israel. Let's put it that way. Anyway, it's a long story. I can't go into it, but. But the idea of intercession being connected to this man who loved Israel and so on, and then the night and day intercession movement that and worship movement that was going to wind up landing on his property that looked impossible, so many impossibilities. They are now in a tent, not their whole ministry, I hop, but they are pitching a tent on Harry Truman's property, and people from all over the world are coming right now, starting today, to worship the Lord. So the first link I have on this is um uh let me go to it so i i put it as the send live from kansas city because it's really a per precursor to the the send event that's happening so i was watching this morning mike bickle lou engel a bunch of other people there praying uh on the mic open lots of people and so it's live you'll want to watch it it's fun all right but you want to look at the other uh, links first because you'll probably get locked into the worship and not want to go out so the three links that were sent to me that have to do with what I'm about to talk about, first of all, is on the last battle. Okay, so I'm talking about warfare. Now, a little different than you might think. I'm actually talking about how the Prince of Peace is going to bring warfare to an end. Got a lot to say about it. But uh, so, boom, I get a link this morning about the last battle. battle. That's going on. Boom, I get another link about... Our posture as believers in agreeing with God what he is doing in the earth to bring this natural and spiritual warfare, light and darkness, good and evil, to end. We're either going to be on the Lord's side helping to bring his ultimate goals to pass, or we are going to maybe even by default be on the enemy's side trying to, in the name of social justice or someone's human rights or whatever, help bring the enemy's plan to pass. Now, that's a, that's a huge thing to unpack, and I don't have time to do it, but I'm, I mean, people do this. People drift into uh, the enemy's camp, and they actually call good, evil, and evil good, and they think they're doing a good thing, and they're fighting for human rights and all that, and really, they're, they have perhaps inadvertently, now some intentionally, but many inadvertently move to the camp of really not, not the Lord at all, not what the Lord is trying to do. God does what he does in compassion, but believe me, he stands for righteous. Hi, let me see, is that Sabrina? Sorry, sometimes I can't see the name very well. Welcome. All right, and so that's um, the second one. It's called What Fascinates Assassinates. And then the third one, uh, God and war, just a message uh, generally about that. So that's all I'm going to say. Those links at the uh, bottom of the description box. Now, somebody told me yesterday, and I want to repeat it because uh, it never occurred to me that people didn't know this, but at the top of this program, when you're done and you click out, you can go back. This program will remain on Facebook indefinitely. And uh, these things are 478, 76, 75. You can go back. If you had the patience to go back, you can go all the way back to program number one, I think. Okay. But as you uh, check out and you click off and then you go back and look at it, the comment or not the comment box, the description box, which is at the top of the program, contains all the notes that I use. Hey, Kevin, how are you doing, brother? Good to see you. So... Someone had commented yesterday, I didn't know you could copy and paste the comments or the, uh, the study notes, right? The verses and the study notes and the links that you could copy and paste those into another document. Yes, I do it every morning. I write them out on my notes. Most of you on your phone, you have a notes thing where you can take notes and save them or you can send them to you by email or by text. And uh, so I'm cutting and pasting um, scriptures that I'm going to use, uh, links that I'm going to use, <coughs> writing the, my own thoughts that I'm going to use, and then I cut and paste them from my notes or whatever that's in my phone onto 
uh, the Facebook description box. You can do the opposite. You can, you can highlight all of those notes and then you can send them to yourself. You can send them by email and then you could actually print them off if you wanted to, okay? I'm, I'm not trying to get you to do it. I'm just saying you can do it if you wanted to hold those notes for another time. You could do it, all right? Because sometimes that's easier than actually trying to go back and remember, well, now, which one of those messages was it? Was it number this? Was, what was the subject? I remember he was kind of talking, people do this, they'll contact me. What was that message where you mentioned this? And that this, I probably mentioned 20 or 30 times in different programs, so it's kind of hard for me to find. So if something sticks out, you can do that. All right. Entitle this today, Beating Swords into Plows or Plowshares. When you see the word plowshare, it means a plow. Okay. Beating swords into plow. Now, there's not to be confused with Joel chapter 3, where God is calling people to warfare. And he's saying, it's time for you to take your plows, if you don't have a sword, and beat them into a sword. This is the opposite. This is looking for the ultimate day. Do you realize there will come a day when the war will end? There will never be another war on planet Earth. As a matter of fact, there will never be violence on planet Earth. We have had 6,000-ish years to develop anger and bitterness and violence and death and killing. The scripture says that when heaven, and believe it or not, I know this is a stretch for some of you, heaven will be on earth for real. Okay, this is not just uh, like a Bill Johnsonism or like that one prayer when Jesus said, as it is in heaven, let it be on earth. They are two separate places now, kind of. Okay, there is a literal, physical heaven, which is atmospheric and uh, and then there is heaven on earth where the spirit of the lord is where the presence of jesus is because it is his presence that makes heaven heaven there that is right now the kingdom of god what did jesus say is among you in other words it's at hand it's here right now but it's also growing the ultimate fulfillment of that will be when god himself takes his big old giant hand like that claw machine you see at 7-eleven and he will I'm just joking. When he takes the new Jerusalem and he just literally, boom, sets it down, the city of God, the new Jerusalem, it's not a metaphor, it's a real place. It is uh, so real that God described it and had someone measure it. It's this many miles high, this many miles wide, and so on and so on. It will literally exist on the planet. It will literally, God will set it down on uh, the grounds in Jerusalem. It says the mountain of the Lord's house, that's his city, will be exalted literally geographically, physically lifted up above all the other hills and mountains on the earth. Okay, it's a whole study there, not meaning to go into that, but the idea is that one day heaven will be on earth. One day the prince of peace will come and war will cease to be. Okay, <clears throat> now I'm not saying that'll happen the instant he touches the ground. The Bible says that the same Mount of Olives that he was taken from, right? And I know I'm throwing a lot at you. I kind of do that. I kind of fire hose you. So you may have to go back and hear it again. But Jesus, when he was lifting off the Mount of Olives, okay, here's the Mount of Olives. Jesus is standing up here, and there's a whole bunch of people standing around. And uh, all of a sudden, it says a little twinkle toes. He goes up to heaven, right? And the angels, why are you standing gazing? I don't know. A guy just lifted off the earth and floated up to heaven, Okay. That's pretty cool, okay? But he said this. He said, the same Jesus that the angel said, the same Jesus who you have just seen taken up to heaven will so come in like manner. And the Old Testament actually declares he will come back to that very spot, not just to the earth in general, but to the spot, to the Mount of Olives. And it says his feet, I forget where this is, it's Old Testament somewhere. It says his feet will touch the Mount of Olives and it will split in half and then split. So it'll go like east and west, north and south, and then it says the river of God will flow through it. And there's just a lot. I can't talk about everything. But the idea is he will sit on a throne in Jerusalem. And at least in the beginning stages or in the next level of our development on the earth, heaven will be on earth. Okay, so is heaven on the earth now? Yes, it is. As long as there's a human being who lives and breathes and walks and loves Jesus and the presence of God is on the inside of them, yes. It is growing, right? Jesus said his kingdom is growing. It's like leaven that gets stuck in a piece of bread. You can't stop it. You can't. You know, I don't know, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? There's nothing you can do about it. It's going to grow and spread. It's going to take over. All you can do is decide which side you're going to be on. Jesus talked about this when he gave his parables. He said that the kingdom of heaven is like a king who went into a far country. 
And his citizens said, we don't want this man to serve over us. And when he came back, what happened? Well, it wasn't good for them, right? But the ones who said, we do want him to serve over us, just because he's gone, we still are going to love our king and so on. They get exalted to positions of being able to help him rule and reign in the development of this kingdom. So Jesus comes back to the earth. What's advancing right now comes, I wouldn't say to its fullness, okay? Uh, we say when Jesus comes, the kingdom will be at his fullness. I don't know that that's entirely doctrinally correct because for a thousand years, there's a whole lot of just stuff that's going on and, and really it doesn't come to its completion until the end of the thousand years and all that. So when all the devil and all the wickedness and all that is finally just, God says, I've just had it. He picks it up, he casts it in the lake of fire. Okay, point is you want to be on the right side. All right, so I want to talk specifically this morning about beating our swords into plowshares and about the kingdom. So let's start with Romans chapter 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God, okay, the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, Paul was just talking about, you know, don't offend your brother for your meats or your drink or whatever. I'm not going to go into that. But let me, let's talk about what the word kingdom means, okay? You know, I'm a word guy. The word kingdom, it's two words. Often, if you think of the syllable breakdown, you can think of the word breakdown. And, you know, it doesn't really matter too much what these words, because words tend to transform and develop and evolve over time. We'll start them out meaning one thing, and then they'll wind up meaning something different. So this is why there is some level of importance. I'm not saying you got to be a Hebrew and Greek scholar, but but to, to know what it means now is not nearly as important as to know what it means then. So the word kingdom, two syllables, King, dumb. It doesn't mean dumb like D-U-M-B, dumb. <clears throat> it's D-O-M, which is short for dominion, okay? King, dominion. You need to understand, first of all, before we even talk about what the kingdom is, we need to talk about what a kingdom is, any kingdom, okay? Hey, Cheryl, God bless you. I've been praying for you. Yeah, whatever's happening, God's in control. All right, so a kingdom is the dominion of the king, what the king has dominion over, okay? If you think of like the ancient kings in the different places, you know, maybe you watch Lord of the Rings or some movie, you got a, this kingdom of Aragon over here and then this kingdom over here. Well, they, you know, they don't rule the world. They rule the, what they rule, what they have dominion over, what they've conquered, what the people have voluntarily given themselves to. So a kingdom is a dominion over that a king, some uh, an area, group of people, geographical area that a king has dominion over. The earth is the Lord's, hey, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So in one sense, God is king over all the earth. The earth is his kingdom. However, listen now, he has voluntarily subjected what he will ultimately rule over to mankind for the purpose of creating voluntary, voluntary love and submission to this king. So he could right now just take it all. He could appear in the sky, you know, do whatever he wants to do. You know, he's not powerless. Listen, whatever he doesn't uh, like have dominion over is because he's doing that voluntarily. He voluntarily is surrendering. The earth is the, is the sons of men, or excuse me, the heavens are the Lord's, it says, but the earth has he given that's voluntary, given to the sons of men. Well, now, why did he do that? Because he's not looking for slaves. He could make slaves. Let's just put DNA in you to where you can't disobey. You're going to love me, although you can't really love someone involuntarily, right? It's got to be an act of love is voluntary. By very definition of what the word means, love is voluntary. So he could just make everybody serve him. That's not what he's going for. Do you get that? That's why the great commandment is love the Lord your God. And that's why he's not forcing people because he's trying to win our affection. Do you get that? Man, if you don't get anything else in this message, understand he's trying to win your affection. He could take you and make you do what he wanted to. That would be super simple for him. Okay, zap. Oh, you don't want to obey me? Boom, you're a, you're a puddle of grease. You know, or let's just pick you up like the Pinocchio doll and make you do whatever I tell you to do so I can feel good about you obeying me. No, he's trying to win your affection. Okay, that's why the cross, he said, if I be lifted up on the cross, not in worship, although that is right too, but when I be lifted up on the cross, I'm going to drive everybody to me. Why? Because they're going to see how much I love them. So the kingdom, 
the dominion of the king is at this particular point voluntary. And ultimately in heaven, there will be no involuntarily, involuntary subjects. Okay, do we need to take a breath? I know I'm throwing a lot at you. In heaven, there will be no involuntary subjects. The Lord is creating such a scenario to where he is giving people a choice. And don't you worry about that person and what about this person and that guy in Africa or what about that person that never heard Jesus? Listen, that's not your business. Your business is to proclaim the gospel. God will take care of that. Trust me. He knows every human being. He knows every person's what they've been given, what they haven't, blah, 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 blah. Don't waste your time trying to figure that out. You be who you're supposed to be. So we're in this process where the kingdom is about God winning voluntary hearts to him. I'm a prisoner of love. Some of you know that old song. I'm a prisoner of love. I'm a slave to the master. I willingly toil through the heat and the cold. I seek no reward in this earth below. But payday will come when the pearly gates unfold. Sorry, putting up in my singing. I'm a prisoner of love. I do this voluntarily. He doesn't have to make us have to threaten me with hell. Okay? So God says, ultimately, I'll give you what you want. All right. So that's the dominion of the king. There will come a day when he will return and he'll say, okay, all you guys that don't want to serve me, I've tried my best to prove my love to you. Yes, I gave you parameters. I did that to protect you and I did that to protect others from you. If you want to go all, you know, evil and all of that. So now it's over. Let's, let's separate. You guys can go serve darkness and the enemy and you guys come with me. So that's oversimplified. No, that really is what it is. And one day, We'll see it. All right. So the kingdom of God, it states what it's not. And I don't want to go into that. I don't want to state what it is. Three things, righteousness, peace, and joy. Let's look at those three things. Okay. So remember, there cannot be a kingdom without a king. Okay, let that sink in for a minute. There cannot be a kingdom without a king. Now let's break that down just a little bit more real quick. There cannot be, now a kingdom and a king speaks of governance. Okay, we see the Lord as Papa. We see him as the bridegroom. We see God as provider. We see God as healer. We see God as savior. All of those are absolutely wonderful. But we need also to add to that mix to see him as the, the uh, king. He is a king. And what does a king do? A king rules over people. The scripture declares over and over, he, he does rule over people. But he rules over voluntary lovers who want to be ruled, who want for to know his wisdom and his ways and, and give us the parameters. We want to walk in them. OK, so the king, if think of your uh, let's just think of the United States for a minute. The United States is a kingdom. We don't call it a kingdom, but it is a dominion of a leader. OK, now, whether you like or dislike and probably most of you dislike our current president, not going to go down that road, but he is. You know, you could take the word king and you could put president, you could put supreme leader, you could put you could put a number of titles for the main person or persons, king and queen, whatever, that rule a group of people in a, in a geography, but it all basically means the same thing. They have dominion over people and over a certain group. All right. Our kingdom of this country and other countries, the United Kingdom, Maybe uh, Carmen will come on this morning. She's the one UK person, the United Kingdom, okay? It's about people that rule and people that are subjects. Now, that's, we don't like that word, subjects and all that, so anyway. All right, righteousness. This is how God does authority, okay? This is how God, thank you, amen. Dictator, yeah, that's the bad one, okay? God does leadership, and authority this way that I'm about to tell you. Now, this matters because you need to know the kingdom that you are currently an ambassador of and that one day you will be fully engaged with. Okay, his kingdom revolves around three primary issues. The first one is righteousness, okay? Now, righteousness, peace, joy. Let's look at the first one. Number one, and again, I'm reading off the notes that you have too. A kingdom, his is, first of all, a kingdom 
of righteousness. Again, you look at the word righteousness. That's three syllables, right? Right, use, ness. Right, use, ness. Righteousness. Now, the kingdom of God, everything is done right. The kingdom of God is a place where right prevails over wrong according to the king's definition of right and wrong. We often talk about self-righteousness. We say that person is self-righteous. And really what we mean is, usually it means they're kind of proud, their nose is up in the air, they're arrogant. Really, self-righteousness means this. It means the righteousness of self. In other words, I get to say, this is not the only definition, I'm just saying it's partial. I get to say what's right. This is what the world walks in. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, I know it's good. I know it's evil. I'm going to do what I think is right. I'm not going to do, and, and there's different levels of this. Some people submit to a little bit of what God says is right and wrong. Some people, a lot. Some people, none. Some people, why did the heathen rage and, and the people imagine a vain thing saying, let us cast off his cords or his parameters, his commandments, his boundaries, because we don't, we're God. I got it. I'm not going to do it anybody. Says, I'm going to be my own person. I did it my way. The old Frank Sinatra song. You get that? So the opposite of voluntarily submitting out of love because you love him and you trust him like you do your good mom or dad, right? The opposite of that is I hate you. You're terrible. You know, if you were love me, let me do whatever I want or you'd never let this bad thing happen to me. That's the opposite of rebel. So right useness is the idea of submission. But it's also, think about this. Everything in the world has a right use and a wrong use. Mentioned earlier, this laptop that I have right here with all the stickers, this laptop could be used for right or wrong. A right use would be this right here. I am reading off of this, the notes that I have, uh, that the Lord gave me this morning. And I'm giving them to you as bread, as food. I'd say that's a right use. Uh, there are probably many right uses. Maybe I turn it on and listen to worship music. You know, maybe I get some needed information of stuff going on in the world. Maybe I look at what's happening in Ukraine and pray for them because now I know what's really going on and so on and so on. Those are right uses. What would be wrong uses? Well, if I picked it up and bashed someone in the head with it, that would be a wrong use. Okay, if I looked at wickedness on it, pornography, some kind of evil, uh, that would be a wrong use. If I obsessed over stuff that I had no business, or let's say I just spent all of my time on it, like we do our phone. Okay, phone's a great example. Right now I am looking into my phone. Yes, I do this program on my phone. But let's say I get off this program and then I spend the rest of my 12 hours of awake time just gazing at stuff. Do you really think God intended you to just spend massive amounts of hours playing video games all the time, looking at your phone? All now, again, I'm not saying... The, the, the component, there is a right use-ness and a wrong use or unright use, all right? And sometimes there's kind of this gray area, right? It's not wrong for me to look at a video game or not wrong for me to look at a newscast, but it can drift into that. And you got to be honest with yourself, okay? I would say for me, if I spend a whole bunch of time, okay, blah, blah, blah. All right, get back on track. So righteousness means everything is done right. Everything that God has created, it is only used for its right use, which is its intended use. Okay, God makes fire. Fire can heat your, your body. Fire can cook your food. It can also burn your neighbor's house down. Okay, it's everything in the kingdom of God is based on what he declares is the right use of not only my life, my relationships, but even the material things of the world. You get that? Okay, something worth thinking about. So that's righteousness. Um, I want to talk, in addition to that, about the throne. So the kingdom of God is done rightly because there is a king who sits on a throne. Now, what I'm hoping to help you understand is that this king, this throne, is not a metaphor. I know some people believe it is. All due respect to you. But the Bible seems to be very clear about a real Jesus, a real God-man, who in the beginning was the Word, he became flesh and dwelt among us. Now he sits at the right hand of God the Father. He's still human and he's still divine. He's still very God and very man. He will return 
to the earth physically in physical form, bringing the saints with him, and he will sit on a throne in Jerusalem. I'm going to read that scripture to you because you've probably heard it, but maybe you've never looked it up. Well, here it is right here in front of you. There's actually a number of them. I have only have room for a few. But I want you to understand that this man, Jesus, that you love and worship and sing songs to and read about in the Bible and talk to hopefully all day long is literally going to appear before your naked eye and literally going to come in the clouds. And it says you will see him. That's what the angel said when Jesus ascended after the resurrection. He said, this same Jesus who you have just now seen, seen, go up into heaven, you will see him come back again. So let's read what it talks about. Now, this is huge. Because you need to understand that whether you live, I think it's very likely that some of you will live to see this, but even if you don't, you will still live, right? Because when you go to heaven, when you pass over, you're not dead as we know dead. Your body falls off, but you're still alive. Honey, you're never going to die. Do you get that? Do you realize you're never going to die? We get so afraid of death. You're never going to die. Your body will fall off. And yes, it's horrible and it's awful. And death is an enemy. And I get it. You know why it feels terrible when people die? Be because we're not supposed to. This is not a part of who we are. We are eternal creatures having a temporary earthly experience. So you're going to be alive. You're never going to die. You're going to live. Now, where you live, that's up to you. Heaven or hell, that's, that's your choice. God has said, I just I give it to you. Here's your choice. Choose, choose life or choose death. You got to choose. I came so you might have life. The devil wants you to have death. You just got to make a choice. But you're going to live. You're going to go on. Some of you will see this before you pass over. Okay, I like using that phrase, pass over. Some of you will pass over, still be alive, right? To be absent from the body is what? Absent from the body. Don't you love that phrase? That means you're still existing. You're just absent from your body. To be absent from the body is what? To be present with the Lord or to be in hell. I mean, we're assuming present with the Lord. So you'll be alive and you will then be among those who come back and see him on a white horse, come back and sit on a literal physical throne in Jerusalem. Let's read it. So, is Jesus going to be as a king, or are we all just going to hang out in heaven and have a good time? Nope, he's always going to be a king, okay? Yes, we will hang out. Yes, we will. You'll walk, you'll get to walk, and horses and, you know, food and rivers and jump in the river. Yes, 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 all of that. But he's still always going to be a king, okay? Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, this is when you should commit to memory for unto us a child. Okay, when you read that, it's Jesus, okay? Cut to the chase. When unto us a child is born, unto us a son, son of God, is given. Unto us. He is given for us. That is stunning. Man, if you don't leave this program today and you're not just stunned with the goodness of God, I don't know. You know, don't get all freaked out because he doesn't give you the car you want or the house or the, the, the job. or You know, those things come and go. They're, you know, ultimately, when you get close to going to heaven, like I'm closer than I've ever been, you begin to realize how insignificant... We spend our whole life, oh, I got to have this, I got to have this, I want this, I want that. Oh my gosh. You have a near-death experience, you will suddenly realize none of those things really matter much at all. Okay. Unto us. <laughs> Jesus. Hallelujah. Man, I feel the presence of the Lord. I, I got to say it again. I got to say it. You, you've heard this story many times. I hope you share it with somebody else. It's a great story. I, I got to get the hold of the name of the guy. Guy dies, goes to heaven, real story, true story, literally died, went to heaven, stands before the Lord. Jesus is walking him through heaven. This abbreviated version, my apologies if I butcher it. Walking through heaven, the Lord's got his arm around him, I imagine, and he's showing him heaven. Wouldn't that be great? Come on, somebody say amen. Let me know you're out there. Wouldn't that be great, Jesus? You know, he's walking, he's got his arm around you, walk through heaven, he's showing you all of heaven. And then he turns to the man and he says, all, he, I just kind of see him waving his hand, all of this. I made for you. And then he turns and he looks him in the eye, puts his hands on his shoulders. But I made you for me. What do you say about that? That the God who makes, made everything in the universe, what he really wants is you. God, you talk about a life-changing revelation. If that's true, and if it isn't, then he's not God. That changes everything. I made all of this for you. All the waterfalls and the mountains and the good food and the friends and the mom and dad who passed on and ja la 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 la, just all of that. I get a, I get a mansion in glory, blah, blah, blah. Yay, yay, yay. I love it all. I really do. I'm not being sarcastic. But he said, I made you for me. 
he wants me. Oh, just to serve him, right? Just to bow down. Oh, you're God. Please don't send me to hell. You're... No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Now, sometimes it's hard for us to understand why death and why hell and why the grave and why sickness and why the devil? Why do you even let the devil, ex you know, I, there's a lot of things you don't get about that, but you will. But the most important thing to know is that he wants you. I made all of this for you, but I made you for me. So when he governs, Isaiah 9, 6, when he governs, he is governing not only for you, but with you. Okay, if you misunderstand the governance of God and why, like a dad, he says no to this and yes to, if you misunderstand that, you will stumble. You must kill the lie of the devil that tells you that God is against you, he doesn't like you, because if you, know, you measure his goodness and whether he loves you by whether he does everything you think he ought to do in your life. I shouldn't be sick, I shouldn't this, I shouldn't this, I shouldn't this, I should have this, blah, blah. So we measure his goodness. At one point, we declare unconditional love, and then yet we say, but yet his love is conditional because it takes this condition for me to believe, this condition for me to believe. You get what I'm saying? All right. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the governing, the governance, the government, okay? Don't hate government. Governance is not bad. Only bad governance is bad. Okay, we don't have many good examples of good governance. I got to hurry up here. The government will be on his shoulder and his name. You know what? I'm not going to hurry. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I just felt like the Lord told me to do this. I'm going to pick this up tomorrow because there's too much information here. There's too many good things here. There's just to skip through this quickly. I'm going to do this tomorrow, Lord willing. You need to understand that the most important thing in life is love. That's not just a, some romantic Valentine's Day card statement. It really is. You know, we just watched the news today. A young lady, a woman whose last name is White. I don't remember her first name. You've probably seen it on the news. She was a guard at a prison, highly decorated, 20 years, I think, something like that, a long time servant, you know, wonderful winds up hooking up with a guy in prison whose name happened to be white as well, no relation. How many times has this story happened? People want to be loved so badly that they're willing to put everything else on the shelf for love. She, everything she'd worked for all those years, somehow this guy who was in prison for murder, I'm sure tried to convince her she, he was innocent, blah, 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 maybe he was, I don't know but he convinced her to help him escape. She did what she did because she wanted to be loved. I'll guarantee, now the, the news isn't saying that, but I'll just guarantee she did it because of that. And we hear this story and over, people take their lives. There was a young lady the other day committed suicide because she didn't feel loved. Even animals, even animals need love and attention, okay? I mean, you cannot overemphasize this one particular point. And as we just heard on the news today, this Mrs. White lady ended her own life. At the end, she couldn't stand the thought of going to the prison that she had had jurisdiction over for all these years. Now she would be a prisoner. She actually took her own life. Listen, this is not a, a minor thing. The people that make you angry and, and sometimes make me angry because I don't like people being violent to others. I don't like injustice to others. If I see someone hurting somebody else, I, the righteous rage rises up. And I, I get that. But you need to understand, those people, their basic need is the same as yours and mine. They were hardwired to need love and to give love, both things. Need love and give love. And the primary need of our love is not human beings, although that is hugely important. You've heard the stories of the little Russian kids, the orphans or the, or the, uh, yeah, the orphans that are in some in, uh, orphanage somewhere and they're, they're maybe malformed or something and they don't get any love. I don't know who would ever do a horrendous demonic experiment, experiment, but they don't, this one they gave attention and love to and this one didn't and the other one winds up being mentally, um, you know, disturbed or something. It's hardwired in us to need to be loved. But the first need of love is not humankind, it's God. The God who says, I don't just love, I am love. He is the one 
you need to know first and foremost that he loves you. That is the initial point of love that human beings need. And then, yes, we need to have massive love between us as human beings. It's not either or, it's both and. But to only go to the human level and reject that will never be enough. I'm telling you right now, I'm looking at your face right now, and I'm telling you, if you think loving human beings will be enough for you, and you don't love God, you will radically miss the boat. Because God did not make you just to love people. He made you to love Him. You want to talk about destiny? You want to talk about your assignment? You want to talk about your purpose for being alive in the first place? It's to love God, and then out of that place, to love people. You get what I'm saying? The kingdom of God is not about force. It's not about God being a taskmaster. Do this. Don't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this. That's not it at all. Every commandment God ever gave is because of love. And when he sits on the throne, he sits on the, the throne of righteousness and mercy and judgment and truth. It's all the same package. Okay? I haven't even got past my first verse yet. Are you still with me? Somebody say something. Amen. All right. The coming government of God, the government being on his shoulder, not plural shoulders, there is a difference, okay? I think part of that is because we shoulder part of the government. The Bible says we're going to rule and reign with him. Maybe you've missed that. It doesn't say the government is on his shoulders, plural, like we typically uh, quote. I've quoted it that way many times. I'd make some good friends of mine correct me on that, okay? The government is on his shoulder. Why? Because we shoulder the other part of the government, okay? The priests carry the ark, we will, the Bible says, we will rule and reign with him. He's not going to govern alone. He's going to do it with us. What does that government look like? Well, it looks like righteousness. It looks like peace. It looks like joy in the Holy Ghost. Imagine a world. I like, who's that? Rod Sterling. Imagine a world where people don't kill each other anymore, where people don't lust for provision because the great provider is among us. Imagine a world where people live by the law of love. Imagine a world like that. It is not a fairy tale. You can believe it is. You can live your life with the despot of the enemy telling you that, you know, there's no eternity. Uh, there's nothing better ever coming. We, it's, we're so hypocritical. And I don't mean this to be mean, but I've been to a lot of funerals, conduct a lot of funerals. Everybody, oh, they've gone to a better place. They've gone to a place. So we say we believe in a better place, but then we act like we don't believe in a better place. Listen. And God wants this place right now to be a better place too. Yeah. All right. I'm rambling. It's okay. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government, the governing, the governance will be on his shoulder because we're going to help him. And his name will be called. Now, these names of God, and I'm not going to go into all these names because I can't, but all of these names are current and future. Now, what that means is these names all apply to him right now. But notice what it says. His name will be declared. His name will be spoken. His name will be called. In other words, that means we will finally agree with what his name actually is. It's not saying one day he'll become these things. He already is these things. It says one day that we will call his name these things because we'll realize these are the things that he is. Let's read about it. It's talking about Jesus. This is all the Son, right? This is a dramatic thing for a prophet in Old Testament Israel to say. You're going to be shocked by the names that he calls Jesus, okay? Look at it. His name will be called by you and me, Wonderful. That's pretty easy. Counselor, okay? You need a counselor? You need to go to Jesus. Mighty God. Oh my gosh. Oh no. I don't know if I can believe that. Isaiah called Jesus God. Yes, he did. He called the Son. A child is born, a son is given, his name will be called the Mighty God. He literally is prophesying God becoming a child. Literally. Okay? <laughs> he takes it a step further. He's not done. Everlasting Father. He calls the child, he calls the Son the Father. Now, why does he do that? My belief is because the Trinity acts as one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit one God, three packages. I cannot go down that rabbit trail, but I believe that's why he does that. And then Prince of Peace, okay? I mean, there's a lot to be said about that. Jesus said that. Okay, let me just camp on that for a millisecond. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. That's what I'm talking about. He says he, that, that he says that he thought it not robbery to be equal with the Father. Okay. 
So he takes his name, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus said, my peace I give to you. Here's the peace component of his kingdom, okay? He is the Prince of Peace, the Son of Peace. His name is, uh, you know, he, well, Solomon, who is the type of him, his name means peace. Okay, I won't go down there. He said, my peace I give to you, and so on. We'll come to peace in a minute. And I like this part, of the increase of his government and peace. Now, of all the other things he talked about, wonderful counselor, father, mighty God, all, none of those things he attached to his government, although they, of course, are because those are his character. But notice the one word he double emphasized on, and that's the word peace. The kingdom of Jesus, when fully accomplished, will have no anxiety, no angst. Listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to camp a little bit on violence. I believe sometimes it is necessary to use force and sometimes even unto death. I know many don't agree with this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I don't believe we're just, you know, lock and load. We're Rambo. We're just going, don't you dare put your foot on my property. I'm going to blow your head up. No, no, no. That's the demonic violence that God hates. Listen to me. He hates it. It says in his word, there's some things that God hates. Seven things he hates. One of them is this. God is not pro-violence, okay? That's one extreme. Now, you, you might go to the other extreme. That means we're never supposed to stand up for anybody. We're never supposed to protect the innocent. We're never supposed to defend our family. That is not true either. God fought wars. People who believe in a completely passive God, I don't know how they deal with the old... I guess they say, well, God was immature back then, and he didn't really understand, and he had to do it because of the culture, and now... Listen, there's going to be warfare right up until the end. The Bible says so. The battle of Armageddon. Jesus himself comes on a horse. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, comes on a horse, sword out of his mouth, and their blood flows to the horse's bridle. That is warfare, if we've ever seen warfare. Warfare is horrible. It's hellish. It's terrible. But what I'm saying is I believe that in the process of the Lord bringing about a planet that never again has violence, beating your swords into plowshares, in that process, it will be necessary that lives will end. See, the Lord has an eternal view, not just a temporary view. For us, it's all just about live or die right now. For him, it's about eternity. People being spending eternity in heaven or hell. We never, you know. I know, I'm, I'm trying not to just be uber radical here, but we've got so many preachers in the world today, they will never even use the word hell anymore, even though Jesus did. You know, don't want to offend people. Don't want to, you know, I, I heard on the news today where the, um, I believe it's the New York Times, decided not to use the word fetus anymore because they didn't want to offend anybody. The stupidity of a culture that is not only denying God, but fighting against him, it, you can expect to see it just get crazy. Anyway, all right, here, let me read it again. It says, the last part of it says, of the increase of his government, I jokingly say, this is the only kind of big government we want. Okay, God's government, we will want it to increase. And let me tell you why that matters, because the, the governance of God is heart. It's not law-based. It's not written rules. He says, I will write my laws in your heart. We have a change of law. It's not the written document now, although we live in this world and it still is and it will be until this world changes, until the king comes. But he says, I'm going to take my laws, my ways, my doings, my parameters. I'm going to stuff them in your heart. They're going to be written on your heart. So you don't need the written page anymore. I don't need a law to tell me not to kill my neighbor. I'm not going to kill my neighbor. I don't need a law to tell me don't steal from my, my next door neighbor or covet his, his flocks or his wife or his garden or whatever. I don't need a law to tell me not to steal. Why? Because the law of love says that if you love your neighbor, you're not going to do any ill, I-L-L, -L, ill towards them. You see how the law of love supersedes? Okay. It supersedes. It dominates over. It is greater than. This is why the first covenant was the lesser covenant, and the second covenant was called the greater covenant. It's in the book of Hebrews, a greater covenant. All right, so the increase of his government means our hearts are always his govern. Can I say it this way? His governance over my heart is always increasing. 
It not means he writes more and more laws every day. Or it does mean that he is capturing more and more hearts. Okay, his governance is increasing over the planet, like the leaven in the bread and the, the seed that grows into a tree and covers the whole earth. Is his? I mean, in that regard, it is his governance increasing. But he's talking about even after, even into eternity, because we're always learning of his ways and so on. So the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David. And over his kingdom, David is associated, David was called the anointed one, it's Messiah figure, to order it and establish it with judgment. God will never cease to be a judge that gives his judgment calls. That's what a judge does. I know in America, our thought of a judge is basically somebody that tells you whether you're going to go to jail or not. But that is so, pardon me, immature. A judge's job is really to decide how to fix something that's broken, okay? So God is always making judgment calls. I think these guys need this. I think this guys need this. I'm going to send rain over here. I'm not going to send rain over here. Okay, he, he's always going to be that. You're never going to, he's never going to not be a judge. Some people have the misconception that because Jesus went to the cross and paid for our sins and fell under that judgment, voluntarily went under the judgment of God for the sins of humanity, that God has stepped off the throne and he's no longer a judge. The two things a king does on the throne, okay, we just read it about, it says he's going to be on his throne. A king does two things. He, he judges, he makes judgments, he is, he is the ultimate judge, and he governs and provides for the people of his realm. All right, judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. God has zeal for these things. All right, let's read the next one. I'll try to finish this part of it, and then we'll pick up tomorrow. Uh, talking about the throne, talking about a king. Okay, we're talking about righteousness, peace, and judgment. Um, I probably should have waited on the righteousness part before we established the king sitting on a throne, okay? Because the righteous is what he provides and the throne is where he is. But anyway, I'll read these next two verses. We'll be done. In Revelation, now the throne of God and Jesus sitting on the throne is mentioned in many places. I'm going to read uh, three more verses, Revelation, Hebrews, and Daniel, then we're done. Number one, Revelation 3.21, the words of Jesus. I'm going to ask you, and do you believe his words? Are you just saying you believe his words, or do you really believe his words? Heaven and earth will pass away, he said, but my words will never pass away. I believe that. I believe a million years from now, we'll still be reading his words and still be going, yep, they were true. They were true back then when I thought they weren't. They were true when I thought they were, and they're still true now, okay? These are the words of Jesus. He said, to him, that's you and me, okay? You and me, personalize this. To him that overcomes, okay? Overcome means there's something bad that you have to overcome, okay? It's not all about roses. Life with Jesus doesn't mean I'm now guaranteed everything to go smooth. No, that is exactly not true. <laughs> Overcome means there's something to come over, okay? It's a wall, it's a challenge, it's a this, it's a that. To him that overcomes, and he said this to every one of the churches, that means every one of us. You were called to be an overcomer, right? That means you will have things to overcome. So if somebody said this way, there's not a testimony unless there's a test. If your faith is gonna be tested, your life's gonna be tested, you cannot avoid it. Quit trying to avoid it. And a matter of fact, when the test comes, embrace it, saying this is an opportunity for me to grow in grace and the knowledge of God, and he's going to bring me out of this, and I'm going to have more to my account than I would if I had never gone through the test. Can you say <laughs> All right. To him that overcomes, I will grant gift. So even though you overcome, it's not necessarily that you weren't. It's still a gift, but you did do your part. I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. This is literal. It's not metaphor. The one that overcomes, I'm going to grant them to sit with me. The same way Jesus sat down with the Father. Now, one guy had an uh, afterlife experience of this, and he said when he went to heaven, he saw the throne of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then all of these other people's thrones were like a part of. So it wasn't just one singular throne. I don't know if this how it is. I, I believe the guy. I think he's telling the truth. But all these thrones were connected, literally. If I had a, like I, I've got, I'm looking at it right now. I've got a love couch that's actually two chairs connected to one. So Linda and I can sit right next to each other and hold hands. You know, eat popcorn, watch movies, whatever. So that's just two chairs connected into one. What if there was a third and a fourth and a fifth? And this is what this man saw. He saw millions of these uh, thrones, as it were. And the Bible does say that we will sit on a throne. 
Maybe not everybody. But the other thing he saw was there was a multitude of people who were not on thrones, okay? As a matter of fact, he saw a lot of these thrones were empty. They were waiting to be filled with people who would meet the qualification of that, be overcomers. I believe there will be people. Now, my dad passed away. He did not live for Jesus. He was not an overcomer. The thief on the cross, okay, same thing. He did not live an overcoming life, okay? Somebody says, well, everybody who goes to heaven is an overcomer. No, no, don't believe it, okay? There are people who die on their deathbed, okay? Um, my dad didn't live an overcoming life in that regard, in the regard of living for the Lord, but I believe he will be among the multitudes who will stand before the Lord. Now, had he lived his life and lived the life of an overcomer through the grace of God, not ever, not never make mistakes, but, you know, overcomer, he would have sat on one of those thrones. Now, that's a guess, okay? I'm just saying. Okay, so there is a distinction is all. I will grant him to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He's not up in Papa's lap. Sorry, I know that's a wonderful idea, but it's just not true, okay? He's sitting in his throne next to the Lord. All right, I'm gonna have to go over for a minute here. I'm so sorry. Uh, Hebrews 1, 8, 9. But to the Son, S-O-N, Jesus, he, God the Father, says this, your throne, and listen to this, the Father, the Father calls the Son God. Your throne, O God, he's talking to Jesus, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Righteousness, peace, and joy. A scepter of righteousness. Now, a scepter was one of those things that they held out, you know, and touched the person. Okay, that is an extension between the government of God and the rule and the authority of God handed out to the person that's in front of them. There's a whole thing there. You have loved, talking about Jesus, you have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows, your companions. Here's the joy component, okay? Righteousness, peace, and joy. Here's joy. You loved what was right. You hated what was wrong. Why does God hate what's wrong? Because he hates what it does to you, period. Okay, that's it. He doesn't feel uh, like, you know, like super offended or anything. He hates what it does to the kids he loves. That's it. If you got, if God didn't love you, he wouldn't hate sin. Now, that's probably an overstatement, but think about it. It's what it does to you. All right, last one, Daniel, Ancient of Days. This is profound. Most Christians I talk to don't even know this in the Bible. It's profound. As concerning the rest of the beasts, the beast being the false prophet, the Antichrist, and so on and so on, they had their dominion. There will be a season, a very short season, just a few years, where the dragon, the false, the Antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet will have dominion globally. It is true. You can't make it not happen. I'm sorry, whatever preacher tells you opposite, it's just not true. It's going to come to pass. It says they had their dominion taken away by God, yet their lives were prolonged for a season. I'm not going to talk about that. And then Daniel says, I, Daniel, I saw in the night, ah, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Okay, he looked like the Son of Man, like a Son of a Man, because he was the Son of Man. Okay, Daniel I don't know if he understood it was Jesus or not or whatever, but he's looking at the Son of God. The Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. Come on, somebody shout. Isn't that what we said in the New Testament? He will come with clouds, okay? I mean, we've forgotten that. He is literally going to come with clouds. That's not just pre-tib, pro-tib, rapture, blah, 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 whatever. He's coming with the clouds, okay? So uh, again, Mount of Olives, they see Jesus, 500 people watch him ascend up into heaven into a, what, a cloud, okay? And they said he's going to come back in the same way in a cloud. Old Testament said the very same thing, okay? Son of man will come in the clouds of heaven. Listen to this, profound. And came to the ancient of days. This is God the Father. Came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given to him, the Son, who came with the clouds, dominion and glory and a kingdom so that all people and nations and languages would serve him. Voluntary lovers serving a lover king. His dominion, okay, kingdom, the king has a dominion. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Once it comes in fullness, honey, it will never go away. You better get on the train now. You better get on the right side now. It's not just about how good of a life you have. It's about something that's eternal and it's coming rapidly. His dominion is everlasting, it will not pass away, and his kingdom will not be destroyed. Wow, come on, somebody say Jesus. 
Somebody say Jesus. Now, <clears throat> close my laptop. Let me just say this. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. We got as far as righteousness today. Tomorrow, Lord willing, I'm going to pick up and get peace and joy. Okay? So righteousness is not something we dissect in the name of whatever out of the kingdom. It is still about righteousness. It is not the only thing God cares about, but trust me, he cares deeply. I dare say there's a single human being that cares as much about right and wrong, about righteousness as God does, okay? Because you can't outdo God in anything. All right, I love you guys. I uh, so appreciate those of you to listen. It looks like I lost most of the people. <laughs> I, I do tend to be long-winded. My, my uh, that's just who I am. So sorry. Anyway, love you guys. Father, bless your kids today. Let them take the words, the bread of life. Let it feed us and let us become all that you want us to be. Thank you that you love us so much that you not only gave us forgiveness of our sins so we could love you, but you give us ongoing day by day grace to love you. We're so thankful for that. Bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, God bless you. As always, give yourself permission to have a great day.